Hello and welcome to Complete Games with me, James. Hope you guys are all doing well. And this is the Scorched Earth Note series. In this group of videos, we're going to be going over the accounts of the four survivors from the Scorched Earth map and doing a read through of all of their dossiers. This is a continuation of the island map read through, as it's my intention to go through all of the lore in Ark and complete the game. Before we begin, I'd just like to tell you I now have a Twitter account. And if you'd like to keep up with when I release new content or stream, that you can follow me there. Thank you. Scorched Earth is a very different map and in the next two videos we're going to be going over the accounts of Helena Walker. She is the modern day biologist from Australia and Helena's story begins on the Overseer station so it seems the best place to continue. So sit back, relax and enjoy notes 1 to 15 from Helena Walker on Scorched Earth. I had to pick the desert why the hell did I have to pick the desert? Well, I suppose pick is rather a strong word for it. I'm still not entirely certain just how I got that console working, but suddenly it started to cycle through the holographic images of different destinations far from the island that I'd been living on. Of course, I had to go and press another button while it was showing off one that contained miles and miles of bloody desert. And here I am. That's just typical of me, isn't it? Always leaping, never looking. Oh well. Better make the best of it, and by that I mean better not die of heat exhaustion. My hunting skills are seriously out of practice. Not that I was ever spectacular, but I feel like I had graduated from smashing bugs with a rock at some point. At least I was thoroughly rewarded with my efforts. Punch was spot on, these big green bastards are carrying drinkable water on their backs, and thank goodness for that. I may never have known if I had killed a red one first, since those carry oil instead. Far less useful when dying of first, let me tell you. I may be fighting the inevitable though. I'm still on foot, still alone. Definitely miss Athena. I'm on a roll. By sheer coincidence, I stumbled into another group of survivors today. They didn't try to kill me or anything. If I didn't know how probability actually worked, I'd say that this recent string of good luck in the universe is making up for sending me to this bloody desert in the first place. The caravanners were welcoming, and the creatures they ride fascinating. They seem like dinosaurs, but they appear to share some biology with camels. Bizarre. For all its oddities, the island never had anything like that. I'll have to study them after a nap. All this desert survival's left me knackered. If I ended up in this place instead of on that island, I'd have never imagined the ecosystem was natural. Not for two seconds. Take those morella tops. They're a cross between a ceratops, a morella, don and a camel. And the strangest part? There are places on its humps where you can stick a spigot and get clean drinking water. Tastes like piss, but not only is it safe, it doesn't even harm the morella tops. It's crackers, definitely the result of genetic engineering. But I knew that, didn't I? It's time to get to the why. Maybe studying the creatures here with my new perspective will yield some insight. Today, I caught a glimpse of what the caravanners call the Endless Dunes. The desolate sea of sand that apparently surrounds the livable portion of desert on all sides. Now these dunes can't literally be endless, but it's easy to see why one would think that. Not only do they stretch onto the horizon, but they're home to get this. Giant sandworms that will devour anything that sets foot in their domain. I laughed that off at first. Then I saw a creature the size of a train burst up from the sand and devour a wild morella tops that had wandered into its territory. I suppose I'll have to learn to walk without rhythm. As absurd as deaf worms are, I see their purpose. They're a natural barrier. If this whole place is a space station posing as a real ecosystem, then it needs to keep the wildlife and humans inside it contained in a way that appears natural. The island accomplished that by simply being an island. The desert does that via death worms. Granted, a large population of predators with ludicrous kilocalorie needs would never last long in a place devoid of prey. But this is an artificial environment. The station can feed or replace the death worms as needed. It's a little convoluted, but it makes sense. Time to go over the facts. Like the island, this desert is a space station posing as a natural environment. It's inhabited by a large population of dangerous genetically engineered creatures. 
and a small population of humans that are struggling to survive. This whole environment is then deliberately contained by a combination of holographic, horizontal and natural barriers. Assuming the other space stations are at all similar, then this whole thing is starting to look like some kind of bizarre experiment on a grand scale. Yes, each station would represent an experimental group and I'll have to continue this later. One of the caravan scouts has returned in a panic. Something about rocks being alive, which of course is ridic. I long for the days when I thought a Tyrannosaurus frolicking through the snow was the height of absurdity. Compared to yesterday, that seems commonplace. As the scout had so eloquently put, the rocks were indeed alive. Alive in the shape of a massive bipedal golem and exceedingly angry. I was too shocked to scatter like the others when it charged and for a moment I was certain that I would die. Then something even more ludicrous happened. Lightning crashed into the golem, but it didn't come from the sky. It came from the mouth of a bloody dragon. I don't recall much else. Fear and instinct pretty much took over for the rest of the day, and while that helped me survive, I'm once again on my own. I remember now. The dragon had a rider. Rather, the wyvern did. Two legs means it's a wyvern. Struth, listen to me. Fighting to survive and still finding time for semantics. The rider was covered up too well to get a good look at them. Could it have been Mei Yin? No. That's stupid. I don't know if she's even alive. Much less in the desert with me. It would just be like her though, to have tamed the meanest thing so quickly. It's nice to pretend that a friend might still be looking out for me. At least, we were sort of mates. Right? Sort of. I could really use one right now. A friend, I mean. Well, I found a new best mate. The little fuzzball isn't exactly what I meant, but I'll take her. I've dubbed her species Renopola amplexorus. They're small, cuddly little herbivores, and as far as I can tell, taming one has no practical use. I just couldn't let her starve to death. I guess all this rubbish with golems and wyverns has quelched what was left of my scientific instinct to leave nature to nurture. At least we provide each other with a little warmth at night. And her antics have helped keep my spirits up. I suppose I'll need to give her a name. I may have been wrong about Renopola not having a practical use. Earlier today, my furry new companion started bouncing around so excitedly that I couldn't calm her down. And then soon enough it started raining. I brushed that off as coincidence. But soon after filling my water skins and setting off once more, she started acting skittish. I decided to find shelter just in case. And within minutes, the light rainfall had turned into an electrical storm. I need more evidence to draw any firm conclusions, of course, but I wouldn't mind having a fuzzy little weather radar with me. You know, it's a little on the nose, but radar's not a bad name. Thank goodness I decided to find some high ground two days ago, or I'd have never have spotted this settlement. That's twice now that I've stumbled into my own salvation. I can't count on that happening again. I need to stay here for a while and prepare before setting out once more. Fortunately, the villagers were willing to let me trade work for supplies and shelter. Another stroke of luck, and another factor I can't rely on. On the island, Rockwell's name got me far, but here I'm just another stranger. Not everyone will trust or help me. I need to prepare to survive on my own. In some ways, surviving on my own was less work. At least then I wasn't conscripted into manual labour. Ugh, my whole body feels sore. I bet I wouldn't have to work if I were as adorable as Radar. The whole village is in love with her. I swear they spoil her like a furry little princess. Rockwell would be livid about this arrangement. I can just hear him ranting about treating scholars with propriety. I hope the old Brit is doing well. Maybe when I've broken this mystery wide open, I'll figure out a way to get him off the island and we can discuss it all over tea like old times. While my mind still can't recall the last time I fired a gun, my muscle memory is much better. According to my would-be instructor, I wasn't a complete disaster on the firing range. I'm no pacifist. Death and violence are part of my life. That's just nature. Yet a gun still makes me a little uncomfortable. The idea of shooting at another human just seems instinctively wrong to me. I couldn't even fire at the new legion back on the island. But I need to pull my weight. The villagers have been welcoming and patient with me. For their sakes, I need to practice. I may have to put my freshly polished marksmanship skills to the test sooner than I'd thought. A hunting party has spotted a swarm of giant mantises heading in our direction. Yes, 
giant mantises. I haven't spotted them with my own eyes, but the villagers have spoken of them every now and again. They say the insects have these little hands that can actually grip and wield weapons and tools. Sounds absolutely loony, but so is the idea of a mantis swarm at all. They must share ghost mantis distaste for cannibalism. No one seems keen on fighting them, but they're too close to outrun. Hopefully they'll just pass us by. So that concludes the first part of Helena's account of what happened on Scorched Earth. We continue in part two of this video at the same time tomorrow night. As always, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new here for more ARK survival content, gameplay and tips and tricks. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games and I'll see you. Thank you.